Hello and welcome to Conservation Matters. I'm Shane Mahoney and I have dedicated my life to the conservation of wild animals and wild places. I invite you to join me as I explore the science, the issues and the challenges impacting global conservation in the 21st century. Together we will seek solutions and together we can affect change. Conservation, after all, is everybody's business. One natural world, one humanity, one chance. Conservation matters. To learn more, please visit conservationvisions.com. Thanks for listening. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shane Mahoney. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Conservation Visions which is a conservation organization that I lead and I formerly was uh, the head of wildlife research in Newfoundland and Labrador and have done a variety of things obviously in the conservation theater um, and am in recent years quite heavily invested in international conservation issues and have taken from that a sort of a, uh, a wide view of what I perceive as the conservation challenges facing us some of these play out in any particular geopolitical uh, region, such as Missouri. Um, some of them may be part of a wider context that do not have as much relevance to a particular area. I would only say, with respect to that, that um, conservation is a global effort and that all of our individual efforts within a specific jurisdiction are part of the makeup of the solution for the conservation of wildlife and the conservation of nature everywhere. We do live now inevitably in a global world. To speak more specifically of our own circumstances and societies and challenges within a, a tighter realm, say North America, Canada and the United States specifically, um, we are now facing a very different world than our conservation institutions first encountered when we began establishing them, obviously, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, developed them even further in the 1930s, had an explosion of efforts in the 1960s, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the great challenges for conservation, and one of the great challenges for an organization such as yours, is to recognize that this world is different, and to lay aside certain myths that I think are holding back conservation currently and which will not serve us well if we hold on to them going forward. Namely, that we can do the same things we used to do, only do them a little better, and we will solve today's problems as we feel we solved in a majority of cases, or in many cases, problems of the past. The truth of the matter is that society has changed so fundamentally and is changing so rapidly now within the United States, within your own state, and with all neighboring states and regions, that we really need novel solutions in many cases, new organizations, new institutions, and new approaches. So I think the first really major challenge for conservation is actually an internal, almost an intrinsic one, which prevents us from thinking in ways that will solve the problems of modernity with imaginative responses instead of trying to go back into the toolbox that we are already familiar with and try to apply those. We have seen how this plays out, for example, in our attempts with hunter retention and recruitment as we tried to build policies and programs that reflected our background and which have almost entirely failed to encourage new people to come into the hunting and angling ranks. Yet, we see the phenomenon of new people coming into these traditional activities largely in spite of us, not because of us and because of our efforts. And I use that only to punctuate my point that we really do have to realize that our relevance in a modern world has to be based on responses that are relevant to the circumstances of today, not the circumstances that we are comfortable with necessarily, nor the circumstances that we grew up with. So this this is, I think, one of the great challenges for all organizations and I believe would be a challenge for yours as well in your deliberations of how to strategically move forward in these early decades of the 21st century. Clearly these changes in society are multifactorial and multisectoral. 
It is a grave mistake for conservation policymakers, I believe, to think about single factor issues as influencing a change in society's views. So for example, we see a worldwide rise in the empathy for animals, for wild animals in particular. This is a real phenomenon and it is not going away. And it is, is a phenomenon that is also apparent in our own countries and within parts of all states and provinces and certainly is part of the makeup of the social attitude uh, and dynamic in the state of Missouri. This rising uh, empathy for wildlife has many, 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 many factors behind it. And treating it simplistically as somehow the work of organizations or individuals who may hold a particular ideological position, whether animal rights or anti-hunting, is in my view a very puerile, a very childlike um, interpretation of a very complex problem or a very complex motivation on the part of society, which is leading to this rising empathy for wildlife. This is a major challenge for conservation organizations, particularly those in Canada and the United States, that still rely very significantly on hunters and anglers as supporters politically, voluntarily, economically, etc., for the programs that they have. This rising empathy for wildlife is increasing, and we are going to see it continue to increase as the movement to cities increases and as a whole range of other changes in society take place. But in addition to this, in all of our states and all of our provinces in Canada and the United States, we are seeing a vastly different makeup in society. People are coming from all parts of the world with different kinds of traditions, different religious outlooks, different attitudes towards nature, uh, different traditions within nature. And all of these things are making it increasingly challenging for state and provincial agencies entrusted with caring for wildlife for all the people to deliver programs that are sort of democratic and relevant to all of the sectors in this rapidly changing society which we face. So I think this changing makeup in society and changing societal attitudes is a huge, huge challenge for you and for all of us that are working in the conservation movement today. Overall, of course, we all must accept that one of the greatest challenges we face is that just simply too few people care. Too few people are engaged in the conservation work and too few people are aware of the difficulties and the challenges and the needs. And indeed, too few people are aware of how they might assist conservation and too few are aware that they ought to be assisting conservation. And in fact, this is because we have failed yet to create essentially a citizen movement for conservation, the kind of citizen conservation movement that Theodore Roosevelt and George Bernal and others tried to launch in the United States of America and which had some very significant success. We have failed to continue to nourish this wondrous, amazing idea. And as a result of that, what we have done is we have begun to ourselves contribute to the sort of um, sectorizing of the conservation world between those who feel a particular way about something like wilderness or those who feel a particular way about something like hunting. We have created in a way um, these divisions that now exist in nature and at the same time, or in the conservation movement we'll say, and at the same time we have failed to motivate very, very large sectors in our publics to become involved in conservation and to recognize conservation as a significant responsibility of theirs. This, I think, is a huge challenge for all of us because with the changing world, with the increase in human populations, with the stresses we are placing on the natural environment, with the expanding list of species that are moving towards vulnerability or even extinction, um, as massive amounts of wildlife habitat are removed from wildlife species almost everywhere. Where we have circumstances where people are in many cases blocked from having access to nature by land ownership protocols and things of this nature, we are essentially losing the opportunity to build the kind of broad-based conservation enterprise that is going to be absolutely essential to conserve wild nature in our midst on this 
one planet, the only good planet that we know of, and the, certainly the only one that we have available to us in the short term. I think in addition to these kinds of systemic, internal, external challenges that we have, we know some that come to mind that are emanating from the changes in the world that we ourselves have induced, climate change in particular. I mean, this issue is going to change the distribution of species, it is going to change the abundance of populations in different parts of the ranges, it is actually going to create novel ecosystems parts of which and shadows of which we will see taking place in every state, every region of Canada and the United States and which undoubtedly will affect ecosystem dynamics in the state of Missouri as well. And these things must be looked to and planned for and, and we must make adjustments in order to deal with them. We also, of course, have problems systemically in that the groups of people who are concerned about conservation are incredibly divided. This comes back to a point I made earlier about these divisions, these sectors that we have built not only in society, leaving outside large portions of the entire public who are not engaged in the, pub, in the fight for conservation at all, but also amongst those who are engaged in new care, we have allowed these enormous divisions to be formed, and these great fissures to keep people apart from working in coalitions towards the common good. This is a challenge for Missouri as it's a challenge for people everywhere and for state commissions and state agencies. These are challenges that must be dealt with if we are going to be successful moving forward in this world of constant change and world of constant challenge. I think in addition to those kinds of challenges, we also face uh, the problem of time and scale. In other words, we know that we are facing enormous an enormous array of challenges and we also know that we have to do something soon to capture this kind of new modern kind of focus for conservation within our constituencies um, so for example let's take let's take the hunting and angling community we know that we are going to lose an enormous percentage of the people who are currently engaged, who have the wisdom and who have the experience and who have been part of that movement that has done so much for conservation of wildlife in Canada and the United States. The, 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 the age distribution of the hunting community means inevitably we are going to lose an enormous percentage of that group and yet we still do not have a way of replacing that particular community in any really effective, with any sort of effective mechanism. At the same time, however, we see the rise of a novel group of hunters coming into the, to the picture, and yet are we doing something to encourage that kind of phenomenon, which is leaning in our direction, or are we still trying to recruit the same kind of hunters and anglers that we've had in the past? In other words, our own attitudes within our agencies within our commissions, within our staffings, within our, all of our institutions may in fact be holding us back from being able to convert our wisdom and knowledge of the past into progressive solutions in a modern world of conservation. I think practically there are many things we need to do. We obviously need to change the way the conservation is funded. Missouri has been far more imaginative and successful than most uh, jurisdictions in this regard but clearly there is always the need for more. We have to find a way to reach out to every single person in society in some way to make conservation relevant to them. Not just what we feel is relevant, but what is relevant to them. We have to work with the emerging attitudes and social trends and patterns in society in a way that captures them, just as a, just as a schooner would capture the appropriate wind we need to be looking at these trends and trying to encourage those ones which we believe are moving in the right direction. No matter how out far outside of our comfort zone those things might be. We have to see a conservation movement that's going to be reflective of the diversity of the people, of their skin color, of their backgrounds, of their traditions, of their religions and so on and so forth to make them understand that conservation is everyone's concern, everyone's responsibility. We need to launch grassroots movements that also are spurred by the knowledge bases that state agencies have within the states themselves so that the people feel empowered in their own actions towards conservation. I can't stress enough that we simply cannot allow professional institutions 
to behave as though they have the solutions for conservation when it is ultimately the actions of every single human being, every family, every business that's going to make ultimately the greatest, uh, the greatest difference in terms of the conservation of wildlife. The state of Missouri is part of the great nation we call the United States of America. The conservation movement that was begun in the early parts, the latter parts of the 19th century, early parts of the 20th century, is a legacy of extraordinary achievement. But we have a long way to go. We have enormous pressures that we must solve. We have a, a reality that public lands are still being debated for their value and worth in this nation and that there are movements to change the way that extraordinarily important and, and wonderful asset that has been applied and exercised and utilized in the United States in this country. We also realize that the majority of the land in this country is owned by private citizens. What are we doing to deeply and effectively incentivize not just large landowners in various parts of the country or large owners within a particular state, what are we doing to encourage landowners who own even tiny pieces of land? Because if we know anything about conservation, it is that it's the nexus and network, the pattern of land and its distribution and its characteristics that ultimately decide how rich and how imaginative we ourselves can be in terms of realizing conservation achievements. This too is a, an enormously important frontier for conservation right now. We need to bring to the private land effort the same kind of major thrusts and institutional innovations that we brought to public land issues in the last century and more. I think we have to recognize that the changing dynamics of our society and even the current statistical uh, evidence that we have clearly indicates that a critical component of our conservation efforts, namely the hunting and angling community, remains a relatively small percentage of our societies. And we have to understand that they have enjoyed, and certainly the hunting community, of which I am a proud member, has enjoyed inordinate levels of influence relative to many other sectors in society. We know this is true. We absolutely know this is true. We also know that agencies, of course, have made strides since the 1960s and onwards to reach out to wider sectors, but we still recognize that we are not necessarily the agencies for all people that we ought to be. And this has to be a major effort on the part of agencies to convince the broad public that they represent all of them. We have major threats coming to on the front of the privatization of wildlife in the United States of America, in many states and in many places. The idea of captive wildlife and the extraordinarily important issues of disease transmission between wild and captive animals, of course, is a growing concern and issues such as CWD could in fact be of profound influence on the conservation movement going forward and could, could shatter many of the existing relationships and liaisons between state agencies and constituencies that we have so long relied on. What happens if wildlife becomes viewed as an entity that uh, is diseased in some way or has become something that is, that is vermin to people? What would this do to change uh, the attitudes of people towards wildlife in our jurisdictions? We have to think about these kinds of issues. We have to think about the fact that our emphasis on small suites of organisms can no longer be primarily the mandate of our state and provincial agencies, but that all of nature, all the entirety of ecosystems must be looked upon. And finally, I would say, we have to find a way to make conservation relevant to people at their level. Citizens have to believe that the conservation of nature is of direct importance to them that something is coming to them, their families, their children, their communities, by virtue of the policies, laws, and institutions that state agencies and state governments establish, who after all are the custodians, who are responsible for the public trust resources of the United States of America. This suite of challenges leaves us at a position where we have to make rapid change 
we have to leave behind the notion that all we have to do is to do more of what we always did and realize that we have to do new things in this rapidly changing milieu. And we have to find the best in ourselves to abandon those things that we might hold as professionals dear to us and try to find ways to bring communities to the table that have vastly different views, but for whom wildlife is a right and a legacy just as it is for every single citizen in the United States of America and in the state of Missouri.